Thank you so much. Um, can I just start by saying, um, Pastor David Chi on you, the anointing you guys carry is pretty amazing, and uh, it's just been a real privilege to be here. Your, your hospitality, we greatly appreciate. Um, just having us in your home is a big deal, because most of the time, of course, you get to stay in hotels, which is nice, but there's nothing like uh, the family value and the family anointing that you carry. So can we just honor your pastors for a second? <laughs> Um, this is my beautiful wife, Libby. Would you stand, sweetheart? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've been ministering in worship for as long as we can remember. Since we left school, we've been in full-time worship, uh, full-time ministry. Most of that in music and, and in particular this last 20-something years in, into worship. So we've had the honor and the privilege of seeing what God is doing in worship around the, around the world. And, um, and so we feel a heavy responsibility to be able to teach and to equip the local church in worship. Uh, and the local church, of course, is just filled with local people. That's, that's about it. So, you know, one family that knows how to present themselves before God. We're just going through stuff. All of us are going through stuff. And it's how we go through that stuff and respond to God in the midst of it that I believe is the heart of our worship. And um, so that's, that's what we want to talk about just before I get kind of rambling on. We do have some things at the back, and um, uh, a few years ago, a friend of mine called and said, you, I, I was praying for you, she's quite prophetic, I was praying for you, and I felt you need to spend some time in the Word, because he wants to download some stuff to you. Um, and so I didn't, because I'm a musician. And so, <laughs> and so then, uh, eventually I was teaching somewhere else, and um, I opened the Bible to to put together some preparations and notes. And all this stuff just downloaded into my head. It was like, um, you know, the movie The Matrix? Anybody seen The Matrix? Yeah, it was like God plugged something in the back of my head and this came out. It's called Rebranding Worship. And it's, um, it's, it's just a, it's what I was speaking to the worship teams about yesterday, about how, how just reading through the Old Testament and seeing really what God's definition of worship truly is. Because it has nothing to do with singing and music. It really has not a lot to do with feelings even. It's really just about a choice and a sacrifice and obedience and then an emotional relationship with God. And so all of that, just when you look through the Old Testament with those glasses on, it's just so obvious and so... Uh, and hopefully after today you'll get a little glimpse of that. So you can get that at the back. My wife is probably the most beautiful worshipper I've ever known. Um, and so she wrote a book called Journey, and it's it's a uh, throughout all these years, you know, you never get to you, you you never really get to minister without proving what you minister. Yeah, anybody know what I'm talking about? Whenever you, whenever all the preachers, when you get up and preach a word, then God makes you live it. And so. <laughs> right? And, and so our whole life has been about worship, and Libby has learned to walk a journey of worship her whole life. It means changing thought patterns, it means changing heart, it means not getting taken away with feelings, but using them for the glory of God. And, it, and this, whole, this whole journey has just been a beautiful journey of intimacy, and um, that's what you'll find in, the, in her book back there. It's so lovely. And along the way, we wrote some songs, and so she talks about the songs, and we took some of those songs. There was a band back in the 90s and 2000s called the Parachute Band out of New Zealand. Um, and that's the band that we were, we were touring with internationally for 10 years. Um, so we took some of those songs that Libby wrote and rearranged them and put them on this download card that you can find at the back. Is that okay? Awesome. All right, awesome. Uh, if, there are, if, there were any, if there are any worship people here that weren't here yesterday, there's a card full of worship resources back there, learning about ear and music and everything you need to get into worship music. Good? Awesome. Thank you, Father, for this morning, and we pray that your, your spirit would be here, that, Lord, you would speak and you would minister to hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Through the worship, I felt a real, a real sense of uh, the need for faith in worship. And can I, I want to start with this, this statement. God does not respond to atmosphere. God does not respond to atmosphere. God responds to faith. We respond to atmosphere. 
that's why we play music in time and we play music in tune and we and we play the chords right and we work on the songs and we rehearse them and we try to create an atmosphere in here so that we respond to it emotionally but God is not looking for you to sing in tune he doesn't care whether you sing flat or you sing sharp or you sing in English or Chinese or it doesn't it doesn't matter how, how you sing it matters that you sing with faith. In the same way as it doesn't matter what words you pray, as long as you pray with faith. It's all about faith. And I, 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 I thought the story of, Adam, of Abraham, when God asked him to sacrifice his son, is like the ultimate story of faith. It's like um, he had waited. I always wondered, because it happened in Genesis 22, and I always wondered why it took so long, 22 chapters of... You know, before God asked him to sacrifice his son. Being, uh, being of, of the tribe that he was, it wasn't a weird thing for Abraham to hear that a God wants to sacrifice the child. Right? Yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of the religions did that. A lot of the gods did that. But this God was different. He didn't ask him to sacrifice him when he was a baby. He asked to sacrifice him when he was like 25 years old. In some ways, that's even crueler. That's worse. All it says is, hey, uh, God said to Abraham, hey, Abe, you know that son that I gave you, that you love? <laughs> Sacrifice him to me. And then the next verse, it just says, he got up the next day early, saddled his donkey and went to do it. What it doesn't tell you is what kind of night he had. You know that he had a miserable night. He probably didn't sleep, which is why he got up early. <laughs> I imagine he went through that night, and his big question all night long is, why? Anybody ever been through that kind of night? When you're asking, why? Why are you making me go through this stuff? He had waited long enough for this son to come. He had waited a long time. God had promised him a son and a nation out of that son. And then it was 10 years before he, he complained for the first time. I think that's pretty good because most of us are complaining after five minutes. <laughs> 10 years and then he complained to God and then, and then God eventually came back to him and said, yeah, this is going to happen. And finally it happened. 14 years later, he, he had this baby boy named Isaac. Why didn't God ask him to sacrifice him then? I would have thought that he would have, that, that it was, they had a big party, and then it would be like, okay, this is the time, because now Isaac is finally born. Because I, I think, you, wait, you, they had a big party, and then they're left with this newborn baby in the desert. They're going to raise this kid. Through the desert sicknesses and the, and the hardships and the no food and the no water, tuberculosis and the nearest hospital is 2,000 years away. <laughs> you know, and you know, when he's a teenager, I'm sure he was worried about all that camel racing, <laughs> the, the desert weed. <laughs> there was still a need for faith, even though the kid was born. There was still a need for faith, even though the kid was born. He had a need for faith before the kid was born, and he had a need for faith after the kid was born. Just because you've been believing for a vision for a long time, and then the dream starts to happen, doesn't mean you don't need faith. You continue on with faith. And every step of faith is an act of worship to God. Abraham is the father of our faith, and he had to take one for the team, man. He had to take one for all of us and show us and demonstrate to us what it was like to live a life of faith. But I want to call it worship. Because I think that is worship. Every step, that, every time you say, not my will but yours, you're following in the footsteps of Jesus who lived a life of faith. Not my will but yours. Lord, you're asking me to sacrifice, I will sacrifice. But when it gets to this point, 25 years old, this kid has come a long way. I'm sure by now, Abraham's thinking, right, we've been through all the teenage years. We've been through all the nappies. We've been through every time he got sick. I'm sure he was saying, he was praying in faith. Lord, please don't take him from me. Please don't take him from me. 
right? And then he gets to this point where he's 25 years old and thinks, this kid is now old enough to look after himself. He can take over the family business. He's good. I can die happy. No more need for faith. And then God says, wait, I've got one more test. It's the ultimate test. He says, take the son who you love and sacrifice him. And it, it always wrecked me to think, wh why add that line, take the son whom you love? It just makes it even, even harder. Like, it's like, take the son who you love. <laughs> it's like putting a cut and putting salt in it. Because he knew that one day he would send his own son. And that son, he, he oh, when that son got baptized, the Holy Spirit came down on him and God yelled out from heaven, this is my son whom I love. Maybe when Abraham took Isaac up the mountain, there were echoes of God in the future saying, this is my son whom I love. It was a lesson for us. That God doesn't ask you to do anything that He's not willing to do Himself. But as you walk through every act of sacrifice, every act of worship, that God feels every step with you and cries every tear. There was a time once when I was, um, I was going through a difficult time and I knew that God was testing me. I knew it was a lesson. You know how God takes you through things and you're reading your word and you're praying and you know that He is teaching you something. And I went through a time like that, and I remember being out on this, um, I was praying outside in the rain. Because, you know, it makes it sadder when it's in the rain. <laughs> so, and I was, re I was feeling it. But I thought, I prayed, I said, Lord, I know that you are teaching me a lesson. And it, but it, at the moment, it feels like you're just a school teacher with a ruler in your hand, you know, going, learn your lesson. That's what it felt like. And I said, surely, Lord, you can just let me know that you're a father, that you love me, that you at least feel for what I'm going through. Anybody? Yeah? So I waited there for an hour in the rain, and nothing. <laughs> nothing. So I, and I got in my car and I drove home, and I was, just, I was bitterly disappointed. I was hurt. I thought, God, what kind of God are you? That you couldn't just let me know that you feel something. He, he let me go through that whole night. I went home, and I went to sleep, and I went to church this, the next morning out of pure habit. I didn't feel like going. I just went out of habit, which is a good reason you should get into the habit of going to church. <laughs> but I sat through the church service, and I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear the, I didn't hear the sermon. I didn't hear the worship. I heard nothing. All I could, all was screaming in my head is, Lord, why would you not let me know that you feel something? And right, right at the end of the service, our pastor got up and he said, you know, the service was coming to a close. He said, I'm just going to open the altar. If you need prayer, just come forward and somebody will pray. So I just, I went forward. I thought, like, I just need prayer. I just need to know, Lord, where are you? Where are you in the midst of all this? Where's your fear? Where's your heart for me? So I came up the front and I was standing there like this, crying, you know, just waiting to know where it is. And immediately... I got up there, a lady who we know in our church is very, very prophetic. She jumped up and she came straight over to me and I thought, great, here comes Kim. <laughs> awesome, here comes Kim. She hears from God. She's going to tell me, she's going to tell me God's heart, that he loves me, that he's feeling for me. Right? Well, she came up to me and went, Aah! and then ran away. <laughs> Burst into tears and ran away. And I went, God, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Happened three times. She got up to pray for me, burst into tears and ran away. And I thought, God, what? you won't tell me anything. You won't let me know how you're feeling. And then when someone comes to try to pray for me, you make them cry and run away. <laughs> Why would you do that to me? And then, and then the service finished. <laughs> Pastor dismissed the church service. It was over. And I was like... <laughs> I 
started walking back to my seat, and as I walked past this lady, she kind of gathered herself and stopped me and said, wait, 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 pulled herself together and said, you don't understand. When I came up to pray for you, I immediately felt God's heart, and he was just crying for you. And it just made me cry. It was prophetic what she was doing. Every tear that you cry, he cries. It's not like he's feelingless. It's just that he, he knows what he's doing. In order to grow faith, it's going to. It's going to hurt. It's going to get into a place where you don't understand. When Abraham went through that night, he didn't know. He just said he had to get. To, God was not going to change his mind. He just had to reach a point of faith where he said, Lord, I don't understand why you're doing this. I don't comprehend. I just don't get it. But I will trust you and therefore I will obey. He didn't do it because he was feeling it. He did it out of faith. So many of us live our lives by feelings. We want to feel God before we go and do something. I bet there'd be many mission trips that Pastor David and Gion had been on that they didn't feel like going on. <laughs> hey, I bet there'd been a bunch of mountains and a bunch of stuff you've eaten that you didn't feel like eating. There's been a bunch of stuff that you guys have walked through that you didn't feel like going. You wouldn't choose to go through that stuff. But God allowed it so that you would grow in faith. It's for that reason we stand here. I'm sure Jesus didn't feel like going on to the cross. But he did it out of faith. And so where are we heading with this? Where, where, where is, what is God taking you through now that, needs, that you need to just trust him and not go with feeling? There needs to be a capacity for worship, for faith. The word that, that Abraham used when he went up the mountain uh, was the first time that this particular word for worship was used. He stopped, he saw the mountain, he said to his guys, you guys stay here while we, me and the boy, we're going to go up there and worship. It's the first time this word has ever been used. When he got there, he didn't have to wait for the band to set up. The production truck wasn't there with the PA and the lights. There were no flags, no one dancing. All there was was an altar which he had to make himself, by the way, and his sacrifice. When he used that word, I, I think he understood what he was talking about. He went up there, and I'm sure, the, I'm sure Isaac had figured it out. Um, when Isaac went up there, he was carrying the wood. Remember, he was the strong young man, so, and, and Abraham would have had the fire. So he asked the old man and said, Hey, Dad, we got the wood, you got the fire. Where's the sheep? And I can see Abraham. What's he going to say? I, he just doesn't have the words to say it. And sometimes you just can't blurt it out because what you say will affect how you feel. I can, so I'm sure he was thinking inside, must have faith, must have faith, must have faith, must have faith. And instead of saying, you're the sheep, son, <laughs> he said, God will provide. God, what a prophetic statement of faith. God will provide. That covers a bunch, of, a bunch of bases. You know what that says? It's either God will provide a sheep or he will provide a miraculous answer. Because I know that he has called me to raise a nation and this nation has to come out of you. If he's, if he's asked me to sacrifice you, then you have either got to come back to life or he's going to provide something else. How much does that reek of Jesus coming to us? Of God sending his son to us? There's got to be a miraculous answer. Either he's going to provide, he's provided someone for us, or he brings someone back to life. Jesus comes, he sacrifices, he goes through it, and he brings him back to life. It's incredible. To go up that mountain, and he puts, he puts him on the, on the altar. And this is, this is a pretty amazing. For it to be a, a, a type or an analogy of Jesus coming to us, he had to get on that altar willingly. You know he was a strong man, 25-year-old young man. Abraham, 100 and, what, 125 years old? That's an old man. It's been a long time since he let him win the play fights. <laughs> so then he, he must have got on there willingly. 
But of course he had to if he was going to be like Jesus. Because Jesus willingly went on the cross. So he went up there, he, he, he took it on just as the knife was going up and coming down. The angel comes out and says, wait, don't hurt the boy in any way. For I know that God is first place in your life. There's something amazing about, you know, about proving to God that he is first place in your life. No other gods before me. No other idols before me. It's a, it's a difficult thing to say that. Lord, there are no other gods in my life. Because if we look at our life, I'm sure if we took inventory of what we spend our time on and what we spend our money on, we will see what is God in our life. What we're thinking about all the time. That's probably a good indication of, we, of what your God is. Most of us would say, no, of course God is God. But then we look at our lives. And God has to look, take a realistic look at our life and challenge us and say, am I first place in your life? We work with young people all the time. So the biggest thing on young people's lives is who am I going to hook up with? <coughs> all the time, students. Who am, I, who am I looking at? Who, oh, I love this person. I love you. I love you. I love you. They fall in love six times a year. And every one of them is the one. So how do you know which one really is the one? By keeping God first place and letting Him decide. <laughs> Keep God first place and let Him decide. But it's so easy to be distracted when you feel so much. When you feel like this is right and you feel feel like this one is right. Then you feel like this one is right. And I feel I'm meant to go to China. And I feel I'm meant to go here. And I feel I'm meant to go to Nepal. And I'm feeling like I need to go to Texas and eat barbecue beef. <laughs> Get those ribs. <laughs> Ramen is <one. laughs> yeah, Tough job, man. Tough job. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> Krispy Kreme. You gotta stay away from all that grease and all that fat. in and out burger. Man, you were in and out of faith. No oh. <laughs> yeah, put your faith aside to be there. Yeah. <laughs> Are anybody else getting hungry? <laughs> you know, it's our feelings that we've got to work against. It's our feelings that we've got to that we've we've got to lay down as a sacrifice before God. Otherwise, we are going to be mastered by our feelings. And feelings are a horrible master. They're a good slave. We've got, to, we've got to submit those to God. We cannot be led by our feelings when it comes to faith. To me, feelings are the opposite of faith. Here's an awesome thing. When you come into worship, have you ever felt guilty? There's a bunch of people that come in on Sunday morning, and, and you, you can see the guilty one. I, I can see you. <laughs> When we're up here, you know, I can look around and go, yeah, there's one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're usually standing behind their chair like this. During the praise. I'm sorry, Lord, I haven't spent any time with you this week. You saw what I did last night. Right? Am I preaching right now? It's the guilty ones that come into the presence of God feeling guilty. Well, are we guilty? Yeah, yeah, yeah we don't know now, right? <laughs> According to the Word of God, no, we are not guilty. Because of what Christ has done, we can boldly enter the throne room of God when we need, in our time of need. We can, we can, because of the blood of Christ, we can come into His presence as long as we accept that by, not by feeling. So what are we fighting? Is it fact? Or is it just feeling? The fact is we're clean and righteous and we have righteousness in Jesus. But the feelings will tell us, no, we need to be punished. So what are we... What, after, we, we just got to go against those feelings. After all, they're just feelings. <laughs> That's all they are. It's just that when we feel something strong enough, we convince ourselves that there must be something real in that. And you know what that is? That's spiritual. There's a spirit out there trying to drag you down. When you feel something so strong, 
When you cannot get your mind off something, your feelings are just pulling you there, you think, man, there must be something in this. Have you ever fallen in love with the wrong person? No, don't answer that. You know someone that's fallen in love with the wrong person? You know how fears start? Because of feelings. And so how many people think, well, it, must, it feels so strong, there must be something in it. I know with my head that this is wrong, because according to the Word of God, it's wrong. There's no way God is going to bless that. Okay, I, I'm, I'm getting real now, right? Is that okay? We're getting real. There's no way God is going to bless that. But somehow we justify it in our head and think, no, it feels so strong, there must be a way that God is eventually going to bless it if I just hold on to it. So for me to be able to chop that, not by feeling, but by faith. And say, Lord, I choose you. I choose your way. It's going to be difficult for a while. Just like Abraham had to take that knife. What is God asking you to sacrifice? What is God asking you to push through and choose Him instead of your feelings? What's he asking you to bring before him so that he knows that, you, that he is first place in your life? Because that's the type of person he can use. That's the type of person that brings him honor. That goes out and does things. The, the whole thing of faith, I went to a church. This, this, there's another side to it. I went to a church once um, and I was and I was about to preach the next day, and so I asked them, I said, guys, what do you, uh, well, yeah, what do you want me to preach on? And they just said, you know, whatever you feel, but we just feel that we want to go to a new level of worship. We just want to go to a new level of worship. That's what, that's what the pastor said to me. So I went away and prayed and said, Lord, what do I say to this church? They just want to go to a new level of worship, a new height of worship. Um, and he said, he said very clearly, he said, tell them, if you want to go to a new level of worship, expect a deeper level of crisis. Ouch. <laughs> because you don't become a better worshiper by lifting your hands higher. You don't become a better worshiper by you know, singing better. You become a better worshipper by worshipping through more difficult trial. I don't think anything touches the heart of God as much as worship in the midst of trial. Because it takes so much faith to do so. To be able to, to, be able to turn your eyes to Him and say, regardless of my circumstances, Lord, You are good. Regardless of what I'm feeling, You are trustworthy. Because regardless of what's going on, I trust Your plan for me. I trust that you are developing in me perseverance, character, hope. I trust that you're teaching me that stuff so that I can be a true minister of your spirit and not just one that believes in God when things are feeling great. Amen. So there was this, there was this, there was this other thing I saw. It was, was this amazing. Um, I read this book once and a, and a guy was giving like a vision that he saw in heaven and he, he said he, he, walked into, he, he walked into the throne room of God or he was showing the, the throne room of God. He said the, the, um, the atmosphere in the place was unbelievable. This is the very throne room of God. There were millions of angels just worshipping and bowing down and praising God. Uh, he said it was just, it was just, it was the glory of God was so thick in that place and so heavy that you couldn't help but fall down and worship under the glory of God. Rem at reminders of, of how when they opened the, the first tabernacle at Mount Sinai and uh, Moses and them went to minister but the glory of God was so strong and so heavy that they couldn't stand in the presence of God. I would love to get to that point. Hey, there's only a few times in my life where I've actually fallen down, but every one of those places I could have resisted it. Anybody ever fallen over in the presence of God? Yeah? Yeah? Just to hear this morning? Yeah, you were gone, Bergen, man. Yeah? Nobody else? Yeah? Who, who's fallen over in the, in the presence of God? Could you have resisted it at the time? 
I could have. Yeah, there have been guys who have prayed for me. Sometimes they come and pray and they push. I'm like, I'm that guy that pushes back. <laughs> I'll take the lead. Push back. <laughs> Too many kung fu movies, man. I'm not going down unless God is pushing me down. Because, because I, I don't want it to be just a feelings-driven thing. And there have been so many times in my life when I, when I felt like I mean, I'm going through, through such a feeling time and I believe things by faith, but there's got to be a time where it gets real. And so this, these, these guys would pray for me. And there was this, there was this vision where where he had come in and he felt like, man, the glory of God was so strong in that place he couldn't help but fall down and worship. And then, he, then the angel showed him a small church on earth that were also worshipping. Now, in the glory of heaven, the throne room of heaven, the glory, the throne, the creatures, the beast, the, I mean, not the beast, the, <laughs> the, 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 the creatures that were saying glory to God, yeah, the cherubim and seraphim, <laughs> the angels, everybody worshipped. It was such a glorious sight that compared to that, this little small church that were worshipping, it was just pathetic. There they were, these people, you know, I don't know, 50 people in this little small church, also trying to worship God, but they were worshipping through their weaknesses and through their struggles, and some of them were feeling guilty, some were just going to sing, but they couldn't really sing. And they had, you know, they were trying to worship, but some of them still had pockets of sin that they were struggling through with. Right? Real life. And so, you see, compared to the glorious scene in heaven, it just seemed like pathetic. And then he said, God silenced heaven to listen to this worship. Why? Because up here, where the glory of God was so strong, you couldn't help but fall down. There was no faith needed. Down here, in order to worship God, you needed to worship with faith. You needed to push through. You needed to say, Lord, I worship you regardless of my sin. I don't know how long I'm going to struggle with this thing, but I worship you anyway, and I praise your name because of your goodness. And every day that I struggle with this, I can come to you and I can receive your grace and your mercy and your grace that is sufficient for me. Your mercy that is new every morning. It takes faith to believe that, not feeling. It takes faith to open that word and believe that the blood of Christ is so much greater than the blood of sheep and goats and bulls that it cleanses us to be able to walk into his presence. What an incredible power we have in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Want to hear another story? I went to this conference, right? So one of these places where I got prayed for. Um, I, I had been, we had been in ministry for a number of years, and then I had one of those take time out moments. You know, I had to work on some stuff, and our pastors took us out of ministry for a little while. And so um, I saw this, I saw this conference. Um, that was for, it said it was for the relationally broken. And so um, I knew a friend that struggled with some stuff, and so I told him, hey, you should go to this. And he said, uh, I'll go if you, if you come with me. So I was like, well, all right. I had been taking some time out anyway, and, and I needed some kind of uh, input. <clears throat> but I was, I was almost at that cynical phase. I don't know, you know, anybody feel me? I was getting cynical. So I, but I just went to support him, lucky, because otherwise I wouldn't have gone. And so I went, I went to this conference with my friend, and, and then I sat there, and every session just nailed me. Every session was bang on. I just thought they were preaching right to me about the past and the brokenness and the relationship I had with my parents and all kinds of stuff. And it was like, man, this is amazing. And, and so I would be like, the first session hit me, and I was... I'm going to respond to this altar. And so I went up for that altar call. And then the next session came. I, I, went, I got to the end of that. And then I went up to that altar call. And by the time, you know, I, it was getting to the point where I, five minutes before the end, I just put my pen down and my paper down and wait. And here we go. <laughs> there was something like 23 sessions that week. I was up at every single altar call. And every altar call, I would go up there and say, I am sick and tired, Lord of just doing everything by, and, and 
justifying it and thinking that you're working. I really want something real. Right? Just what I said before. I really want something real. Up until that point, I could have explained away everything that I, that I thought was God. You know when you've got that, those mir miraculous provisions? But then you think, oh, maybe that was just someone being kind. Maybe it wasn't God. Maybe it was just somebody who saw something and decided to take care of us. I was starting to literally lose faith. I wasn't believing that these things were God. I was saying, no, God, I just feel like that was a, that was a feeling, that was a coincidence. That was a, give me something real that I can grasp onto. And so at that time in New Zealand, there was the laughing movement. Anybody remember the laughing thing? Right? You'd, you'd, there'd just be, everybody would break out in laughter. And so, so it would start over here and somebody would laugh and then the, the people would laugh because they were laughing. And then it would spread over and everybody would kind of laugh. But nobody knew whether it was really real or not. And there was a huge controversy around it. Because pe some people were saying, no, this is not of the Lord, this is of the devil. This is, a, this is not of God, it's just flesh. Because somebody will, and you know when somebody laughs, it's hard not to laugh. <laughs> See? <laughs> it's hard not to laugh when, when, when everybody's laughing. So a lot of ministers would come in and go, no, it's not. They were, they were arguing over the radio, radio stations and whatnot. So, um, but I remember needing so desperately something real from God. I said, Lord, I want, I am willing to fall over and laugh. In fact, that's what I really want. So, th so that I know it's not me. I'm not making it up. I don't want to make it up. I'm sick and tired of making it up. I want something real. So, so hit me, hit me now. And I'd go up for each one of these altar calls saying, please, Lord, slap me on the head. Push me down, I want to fall down and laugh. <laughs> That's what I wanted. And lose control. <laughs> and so I went up for every one of these altar calls. And, and the, more, the more altar calls I got up to, I was getting more and more impatient. And some cool things happened. Don't get me wrong. Man, some really cool things happened, but not that thing. So one of them, I was up, I was up like here, and the, almost the whole crowd had gone up. So I was like halfway back down the aisle. And I, and I remember thinking, man, I'm right at the back of the crowd. When, when, these guys aren't even going to get to me for ages. And I'm thinking, Lord, I am, I'm, I'm tired of getting up to these altar calls now. How about instead of me coming to you, you come to me for once? <laughs> As if Jesus hadn't come. <laughs> yeah, it's not kind of not the thing you say to the creator of the universe. So, um, but I'm not kidding. Like I said, how about you come to me for once? And I went and sat down, like in the fourth row. A bunch of plastic chairs, and nobody was there because they were all up at the altar. I'm not kidding you. I sat down. I, I said, said that. I look up on stage, and the bass player who's standing at the back of the stage sees me. Like they were just playing, they're playing something. And he sees me and goes, takes his bass off, puts it down, walks down off stage through the crowd, walks right up to me and says, I'm not sure what it was, but as soon as you sat down, I saw you and God said to come to you. <laughs> it's cool, right? But in my cynical phase, did I receive that? I was like, well, I'm not laughing. <laughs> I'm losing faith, right? And so by the time we got up to the last altar call of the week, I was getting really impatient. And so I'm up here now just going, Lord, this is your last chance. This is your last chance. You better get me now or lose me forever. <laughs> There's a whole line of us down, down, you know, lining up. And I'm saying, you've got to go. I'm getting desperate now. You've got to go. You've got to hit me. And, and while I was standing here, the, the person was praying for down the end. The person got prayed for and they fell down and started laughing. All right, so if I was this way, that, that person fell down. And then I noticed that person fell down, that person, and it started working its way up the, up the line. And everybody was falling down, falling down, falling down. And I'm thinking, yes, here it, here it comes. And that person fell down, and that person fell down, and then this person fell down, and then this person fell down, and, then, and I carried on up the end of the line. I'm not kidding, everybody else but me fell down. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, what kind of loser do you have to be for God to deliberately leave me out and then get everybody out? That was my question. I went, you, God, you got to be kidding me. You deliberately did that. Why would you do this? And then it, and then it hit me. I went, you've rejected me. I thought of my sin, I thought about what I'd done, and thought about the grace of God, and then thought, so there is a limit. There is a line. What an incredible line to believe. There is a line to the grace of God, is what I thought. And it hit me, it punched me in the stomach. And I sat down, I, was, I took the breath, I thought, You've, God has rejected me. And I sat down. And then I thought, but who am I to complain? He didn't do anything wrong. I was the one that did the wrong thing. So he's God. If he's chosen to judge me like that, then who am I to complain? And then in my mind, I flashed through the story of David when he had sinned with Bathsheba and then uh, got the prophet had prophesied to him and said, You're, you will lose the child. And so he went in and he was in sackcloth and ashes and he was praying for the child. And while the, while the child was alive, he, he prayed and prayed and prayed. But then the child died, just as the Lord said he would. And his servants were worried to tell him because they didn't know what he would do. And so they, when they did go to tell him, they were surprised. When he got up, he had something to eat, washed himself, and then went and worshipped. And they were like, well, how come you're doing this? And they said... Because while the child was alive, I had a chance, but then once God, once the child died, I knew that God had made his call, and I just accepted what the Lord wanted. And so that all flashed through my mind in like one second. So I remember coming to the same decision. Lord, if you've rejected me, if you've judged me, then I have to accept what you are, because I can't deny that you're real. I will just worship and acknowledge you anyway. So I started to worship. I was, on the, I was sitting on the stage, I was sitting on the floor, sorry, and I just, I threw my tears, I wished it. <laughs> you know, that's what it sounded like. But as I started singing, something inside was like, started to get a stronger resolve. And I, and I was like, okay, I can I worship you. And I started worshiping stronger and stronger. And the more I did, the stronger the resolve came. And so I stood up, and now I was singing stronger, and I was singing louder and louder and louder until some, a lady came and prayed for me, and she was like, give him more, Lord, give him more. And I was thinking, get out of my face, lady, I'm trying to sing. <laughs> and I just kept singing louder and louder and louder until, until this point where I was just going nuts. I was singing as loud as I could sing. And I kept going for 45 minutes. Everybody had gone, including the band. It was just me in a room. Oh! Just worshipping God. And, and half the time, you know when the, when the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words can't express. Half the time, that's what it was. Oh! Just a groan. But I could not stop. The very thing that I had prayed for and asked for, I got when I chose to put myself aside and accept Him and accept what He was and worship Him regardless of what was happening to me. And as I worshipped, the Holy Spirit came and took, took me and allowed me to be able to just sing, 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 sing. And what was so cool about that was I was singing and not laughing. Nobody could say, you were just following the crowd. I was unique. I was out there by myself. Who's willing to sing this morning? Regardless of what's, what God has got going on in your life. Regardless of whether you're feeling it or not. Regardless of, of what circumstances are surrounding you. Who's believing a lie this morning that thinks that there is a line to the grace of God? Let's rebuke that lie immediately. And let's believe the truth that God is for you. And as you stand and worship Him, His glory will come upon you. He will strengthen you. He will empower you. Can we pray? Let's pray. Why don't we stand and pray?